profiteers. They were with weapons makers. You know, they were really part of the war. That was the beginning of a movement on campus. Until then, there had been anti-war demonstrations on campus. There had been anti-war teach-ins on campus. But that gave rise to a, a spontaneous outpouring. Students said, if they're doing that to us here, if they're doing that to us here for peaceful protests, for doing nothing more than sitting in, maybe the United States is the bully abroad as well. There were students that I knew very well as thoughtful people, and I began to think, well, if they felt strongly enough to put their bodies on the line, perhaps I ought to question a little more deeply some of these things. Well, a strike was called, classes were canceled, probably a third to 40% of the university was stopped on that day. I thought, I, you know, I have to strike. But then the realization hit me that if I were to participate in this, I would have to miss, not show, for my first six-week exam as a freshman at the university. I really had to go inside and decide that I had a civic responsibility to say that what I had witnessed was wrong. There was a real process of transformation in terms of my thinking. I now felt like I was part of this anti-war movement on campus, which had grown into a real, sizable movement after Dow Chemical. October 22nd. Dear Arlene, hello, baby. How's my girl? I'm much better. The doctor sewed up my wound this morning. This afternoon at about 5 p.m., General Westmoreland came and presented me with the Purple Heart and congratulated me for the Silver Star. They had television cameras and lights, too. I wonder if anybody saw me at home. One of his aides, uh, I remember, came to me and he said, uh, look, uh, Costello, we know you're 18 years old. Uh, the general's going to come and give you the silver star, and he's probably going to ask you how old you are, and when he does, I'd like you to say you're 19 or 20. General Westmoreland came into the ward and shook hands and said, congratulations. <laughs> I said, are you congratulating me or the enemy? And I said, we lost that battle. I, I remember vaguely waking up enough to know that there's General Westmoreland and somebody being there, and somebody taking some pictures, and somebody shaking hands. And then I believe General Westmoreland, fine old man, leaning down and saying, well, son, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're all right. Tell me what happened that day. And I said, sir, I said, uh, we got ambushed. Oh, no, no, no. He said, no. He said, that wasn't no ambush. And I said, well, General, then I don't know what happened to the other people out there. But by God, I was ambushed. And I recall then that I said, sir, I will tell you what happened today. The goddamn army is fucked up from the President of the United States on down, and my boss, the colonel, and I'm glad he's dead. A deep anger, still less, towards the army, the organization, the government, the President of the United States. Just uh, <laughs> look what you've done. Look what, look what we've done. On October 20th, I remember being in my bedroom and the doorbell rang. And I peeked out and I saw a soldier in uniform. My heart just fell to my feet because I just knew why he was there. My head went blank and I, I remember just being so cold and shaking and just holding my arms real tight. I didn't want to hear it. And I do remember him saying, killed in action. And my dad was yelling from 
deep in his heart, oh God, no, not Danny. Why couldn't God take me instead? I remembered the dream that I had of Danny and everything just clicked. I knew he was dead. I believed that that was, that was Danny's last goodbye to me in his own way that he reached out. And that was our final hug. Two officers came to the house. They told me that Terry had been reported missing in action. I started screaming at the officers. And I told them that they were lying to me and that I knew that he was dead. It was just loss, loss of so much. Not the passing of someone that we could say died in a way that clearly was going to bring about some greater good. It was just loss. They may expel 13 of us, and I wonder what they're going to say about, you know, the new little clique, the new outside agitators that run this movement, because that's not what the reality is. The reality is that there's a very real social movement in this country. Starting on Monday morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to uh, uh, call in witnesses, and uh, they will be asked to testify, and if they don't testify freely, we will be subpoenaing them. We can assure anyone that it's not going to be a witch hunt. The administration at the University of Wisconsin wanted to punish the students, not just for sitting in, but to punish the students precisely because they were taking positions which they vehemently opposed. And Bill Sewell got trapped. To me, that was a very profound lesson, how men who oppose the policies of their government nevertheless find themselves upholding those policies in practice by virtue of the position and the pressures put upon them. I came to interview Bill Sewell 35 years after the event, and the pain was still there. 90 years old at that point, when he started to describe what happened in those few minutes, seeing the police go in with their billy clubs and seeing kids come flying out with their bloodied heads, he started crying. I went to Mass that Sunday, and the priest was given his homily. And he said uh, something about, well, maybe, you know, we, they have, the students have something to say and we should start listening to them. He got up and walked out. I remember the priest very well. I don't think I ever spoke to him again. I didn't think they, you know, you go to school, you got nothing to say. After October 18th, uh, Rioting in Madison became a routine thing. We were going through $50,000 of gas a week. We had sometimes lit up the streets to the point that it looked like a fog. 